quite a crush, isn't it? <clears throat> Morning rush hours the same in big cities all over the world. In London, Moscow, Tokyo, New York. But in all these cities, and in Dublin as well, when commuters need to get from the suburbs into the centre during rush hour, the train is still their best bet. This morning, I'm only one of 9,000 people who will travel up from Bray, Dunleary, Booterstown and Blackrock on the DART, the Dublin Area Rapid Transit, which fills up the city with working people and at the end of the day, carries them home. Ireland's booming capital could now scarcely function without the dart. It's a magnificent example of a modern urban public transport system and a great 1990s success story. But it's a story reaching back over one and a half centuries to 1834 to the first railway ever to be built in Ireland, the Dublin to Kingstown Railway. And that story begins across the water in England nine years earlier. In 1825, in Stockton, in the north of England, the first rail permanent way was dug by the sheer muscle and grit of hundreds of journeyman labourers. Some died, many were injured, but their gouging out of the earth to make a path for the rails of iron marked a revolution in human mobility. Even though the first trains were horse-drawn, with the Stockton and Darlington line, the railway had arrived. And arrived because of another revolution, the Industrial Revolution. Engineering advances in the 18th and 19th centuries had enabled the mass extraction of coal from the earth. The coal made a ferocious, long-lasting fire which smelted iron from rock. And that iron, when transformed by fire and water into steel, could be fashioned into the boilers, wheels and carriages of the iron horse, which now for the first time meant that large numbers of people could be transported overland in a comparatively straight line from A to B. The other element which made it all possible was human labour. In the construction of the Liverpool to Manchester railway, which cut an arduous five-hour journey on dirt roads to a relatively comfortable two and a half, over 10,000 labourers were employed. These men, many of whom were Irish, put a new name into the language. Navvies, short for navigators because they'd originally developed expertise in building canals. In 1841, me corduroy bridges I put on. Me corduroy bridges I put on to work upon the railway, the railway. I'm weary of Well, I'm not out for only 20 minutes. How did they manage? What happened was that great armies of men from Ireland went to England. There they built the English railways. A navvy wasn't a common, a garden, agricultural labourer. He started that way. But 
it took him about a year before he really became, you know, your, 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 your full-blown Navi. And then, at the end of that year, he was capable, believe it or not, of shifting 20 tons of muck a day. That means with his shovel, he sort of digs down and slings his muck over his shoulder into a cart behind him, 20 tons. Now, the thing with, the, with these people was that they had to work in enormous gangs. If you're building a railway, you don't do it with a dozen men. You use 200, sometimes 2,000. When you've got 200 men or 2,000 men working across a countryside, then they, are, they tend to be seen by the local population as an invading army. And indeed, of course, at times they did their best to imitate it. I mean, you know, they, 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 they did sort of loot the women whenever they could, which is only natural. And they certainly drank, which was only natural. Because again, there was this sort of elite reputation which they built up for themselves. And Navi was not you know, only a man who could ship shift 20 tons of muck a day. He was a man who could eat two pounds of beef a day and eat uh, and drink eight quarts of, of beer a day. A navvy was not expected to live all that long. Um, the average age of a navvy was said to be about 40. He was expected to have died of exhaustion or to have died in some accident by the age of about 40. And a uh, navvy was, was, was a rare creature. And I remember a few lines of McGill's, and he said, How dies the navvy man, the bold navvy man, the old navvy man, safe in the ditch with his toes turned up. Thus dies the navvy man. Most Irish navvies remained in Britain, living and dying as part of a workforce which built Britain's industries and cities But some, having developed their skills, returned home to Ireland to ply their trade, which was increasingly in demand there. On the 11th of April, 1833, here at Salt Hill Cuttings in Dunleary, or Kingstown as it was then called, work began on the first railway in Ireland. But why Kingstown? And who paid the labourers? Who financed the purchase of the land? Who drove the bills through Parliament that would allow people to cut and dig and excavate and lay the track that would change forever the way people travelled and even where they lived? Thirty years after the Act of Union, which bound Britain and Ireland into a single political unit, Dublin was a place of both abject poverty and bustling commerce. A small but powerful merchant class controlled the city's trade. The east coast of Ireland, and the Dublin area in particular, was an integral part of what you might call an Irish sea economy. So, after all, before the railway, transport by water was cheaper, uh, and very often as fast as transport by land. So you have Liverpool, Manchester, uh, you have then the link, the growing link with London via Holyhead. Uh, so Dublin is part, as I say, of an Irish sea economy, you have a lot of the same people back and forth. You have people, for instance, investing in the, in the, in the Dublin and Kingstown who have business in Liverpool, business in Manchester. You sometimes have a father in Dublin and a son in Liverpool, or vice versa. Uh, you have tea importers, cotton importers, uh, traders of various types. And so they see all this as a, a part of their natural economic area. Impressed by the commercial advantages which the railway had already brought to England, a group of Dublin merchant adventurers came together to invest in the new means of transport. After King George uh, arrived in 1821, and in fact the name was then changed from Dunleary to Kingstown, so Kingstown, as I'll call it, uh, became the, the traffic artery to Britain, out of Dublin, and it occurred to the father of the railway, James Pym, uh, who was a very remarkable man, uh, that there was potential for development here. He also happened to live in Monkstown himself. And in fact, several of his closest colleagues in launching the railway, who were Quakers, it, it was known as the Friends Line, uh, they lived in th that part of Dublin. So they're satisfying both their own requirements, if you like, and they are investing in what they see as a, a growth prospect. 
The idea then of building a railway from Dublin to Kingstown was born as a logical development in the growth of the region's commerce. As a result, the Dublin Kingstown Railway Company was formed. But initially, the directors had difficulty in raising funds. Uh, the bulk of Dublin business money wouldn't go near the Dublin and Kingstown. They did not. They did not see it as commercially viable. James Pym and his circle of Quaker friends in particular subscribed something like 50 percent of the total Irish capital starting off. Then they got some English capital and they got Board of Works money. That was where, the, where, where it came from. It's really a quite small circle of people uh, who were prepared to take those risks. Having raised enough money to get started, Pym and his partners next had to get an act of parliament to allow them to build. The first two readings of their railway bill failed. There was strong opposition to it. Um, a lot of people were opposed to, to the Dublin Kingstown Railway. There were um, lots of people who ran cars between the city and the port of Kingstown. There were residents who lived along the line, the proposed line, they didn't want the railway. And there's a very strong group that wanted to build a canal, they thought the canal was a better solution. So there was huge opposition and had to overcome this. But the railway mania in England was a clear signpost to the future, and the act was eventually given the royal assent on September the 6th, 1831. The approval of Westminster and the financial assistance of the Board of Works, however, were motivated as much by politics as commerce. The main government concern was anything we can do to promote economic development in Ireland will cement the union, uh, will help reconcile Irish disaffection to the idea of a union, because with material improvement will come the realisation that the union is central uh, to their prosperity. Uh, so, and the railway, we are told, is the way their mind would have worked, we don't know much about these things ourselves, but we're told the railway is going to be the cutting edge of the next stage of economic development, and therefore the sooner we get railways going in Ireland, the better, and this is the first one, so we, we will support it up to the hilt. On this spot, on the 24th of April, 1834, they laid the first stone of the retaining wall of Westland Road Station, a station from which passengers would embark on a journey that was the wonder of the age, because up to then, of course, the fastest known form of transport had been the horse. And this also brings us to a key figure in the transport revolution, because building railways required just that, building, moving massive amounts of earth and rock by human labor. And that required engineering skills and management skills above the ordinary. The railway was to be built on the seaward side of the rough coast road connecting Dublin and Kingstown. That meant cutting through promontories which had been there since the island was formed. A survey might show a line with a neat longitudinal curve. Translating that line on paper to the iron reality was another matter. Cuttings had to be dug and earth removed, embankments emplaced and secured, tunnels bored through solid rock. These tasks fell to the Dublin to Kingstown building contractor, William Dargan. William Dargan was born in County Carlow, as far as we know, and at a very early age, he moved from there to England to work with Thomas Telford on the Holyhead Road. And from there he came back to Ireland and became the leading Irish railway engineer of his day. He got the contract for the first railway in Ireland, the Dublin and Kingstown Railway, and went on to build about 800 miles of railway. Building the first railway was almost the equivalent of putting the man on the moon. It was, at the time, it was people laughed at, they said, this is nonsense, this will never work out. Um, there was no manual that people could refer to in terms of building a railway. This is the first railway in Ireland, a mere ten, eight to ten years after the first railway in Britain. So it was, it was new territory for everybody, engineers and contractors alike. So Dargan realised, I think, that the future railways depended on the success of this project, and that if the Dublin Kingstown failed or was never built, railways would have been set back at least ten years in Ireland, the development of railways. The cost of the first five miles of the railway was £126,000, equivalent to £6.3 today. Most of the money went on labour and materials, but substantial payments were necessary to appease the people over whose land the line would run. Such an appeasement lay behind the construction of some fine but inexplicable bridges, still in evidence today.
Dublin in the 1830s was an imperial city with a handful of wealthy landowners owning thousands of acres outside the capital. For them, the railway was a democratic intrusion that threatened their leisure and amenities. Two in particular, the Reverend Lees and Baron Clong Curry, refused outright to have the line pass over their land. Their refusal would mean a costly tunnel of 500 yards to circumvent the land running down to the shoreline at Black Rock. The holdup lasted 14 weeks and threatened the whole enterprise with bankruptcy. But money talks are nowhere more than in the rooms of the rich and powerful. The two obstructing landowners, Lees and Cloncurry, were persuaded by the payment of 7,500 pounds and 3,000 pounds, 50 times more today, to allow the access. Your settlement, Lord Cloncurry, thank you, sir. But on the added condition that the railway company would build bridges over the railway for access to the sea for their lordship's bathing leisure and boating pleasure the same to be constructed in a manner commensurate with the style of their estates. And that's why today there are these oddities under which the Dart ferries thousands of commuters daily, most of whom are unaware of how such finely constructed copies of Italianate grandeur came to be in the South Dublin suburbs. Overcoming the delay and digging deeper into his budget, Dargan pushed on with his workforce which by the autumn of 1833 had risen to more than 1,500 men. Despite major setbacks, their achievement was remarkable. And he built it in about 18 months, um, and a large part of it was unique in that he went across the sea from Marion Gates to, to Black Rock. He literally built it on a sea embankment, and they made a few mistakes, obviously, in the process. They, they, got the, um, they used stone sleepers, granite sleepers, and they were far too rigid. They didn't work out. The embankment coming out of Weston Row, Pier Station, that didn't work out so well. There were all kinds of those kind of problems, but the line did finish. Um, they had a terrible disaster, but a week before it opened, uh, the bridge at Landerton Road was swept away in a storm. So there were a huge problems, but they overcame them. The line was built, and despite all the gloom and doom merchants, um, it was a huge success and remained a huge success, one of the most profitable railways in Irish history. Encouraged by the imminent access, some of the better off bought land in Kingstown to build hotels and seaside villas. Soon all would be able to travel here by train. In the meantime, Dubliners flocked out to see the marvel of the age taking shape. They came on foot, they came by boat, they came by horse and carriage. Indeed, it was regarded as unfashionable not to have seen the spectacle of the railworks. Railway building was on a greater scale than anything since the building of the pyramids or since the building of the cathedrals uh, in, 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 in medieval times. It was an absolutely huge task. Again, the hugeness of the task, of course, um, helped to create this reputation of being an elite. By July 1834, there was intense excitement on the completion of the line all the way from Dublin to Kingstown. The directors of the company, having previously had to put up with cynical skepticism, celebrated by journeying the line with family, friends and investors in a horse-drawn rail car. In October, the first locomotive, called Vauxhall, safely pulled several carriages on a test run. Subsequently, with a push to have the railway open for Christmas, on December the 16th, 1834, the Dublin Evening Post announced, the Dublin and Kingstown Railway will be opened for the convenience of passengers on Wednesday the 17th instant. Promptly at nine, the Hibernia locomotive steamed out of Dublin bedecked in bunting, and no doubt bejeweled as well, from what one description held to be a very fashionable concourse of passengers. She was to make many more journeys in the course of that historic day. In all, about 5,000 passengers were carried, cheered by spectators all along the permanent way.
In the first-class carriage, the fare was one shilling, about £2.50 in today's money. In the second-class carriage, the fare was eightpence. And in the third-class carriage, sixpence. It was also announced that parcels would be conveyed from Westland Road to Kingstown at a rate of between four pence and a shilling, depending on weight, and that no train would run between 11 o'clock and half past two on Sundays to allow for religious observance. These policies marked the beginning of a notably effective management regime. They began with only five trains a day. Within four or five years, they were doing 34 trains a day. Uh, an extremely dense service. And the principle was this. James Pym's basic principle was residence. We must get people to live along the line. To do that, we must be able to guarantee a regular, frequent, steady service. Even if some of our trains late at night run empty, which they did, people know they're there. It enhances the attractiveness of the neighbourhood. Pym's vision was to pay off handsomely for the new residents of South Dublin and for the Dublin to Kingstown shareholders. And by the mid-40s, they were paying their 10%. Uh, they were very successful. Land. And remember, because they had cost so much to build, because they were buying land at £7,000 a mile, for instance, compared with maybe £1,500 a mile in the rest of the country, uh, because construction costs were high, particularly in, in, in uh, residential areas, so far as they were residential, and because uh, labour costs were high in the vicinity of Dublin. The Dublin and Kingstown cost £60,000 a mile to build, compared with about £15,000 a mile for the rest of the country. So if they'd been able to build at the average Irish cost, they wouldn't have been paying 10%, they'd have been paying 40% dividend by the mid-40s. This railway, which now carries 68,000 passengers a day, is essentially the same as that carved out by Dargan and Pym more than 160 years ago. But their legacy, and the legacy of the thousands of people who worked on the railway, isn't just the five miles or so of track that linked Dublin and Dunleary. It's in what happened afterwards, in the growth of towns, in travel made more democratic, in the whole island becoming more accessible to itself, remote seaboards and inland communities in economic touch with each other for the first time. Nothing in Ireland would ever be the same again. The railways were the principal active force of the 19th century. And these unknown men, you know, who suffered the most terrible um, casualties, did a hell of a lot of work. Whenever I travel by rail, I look down of a huge viaduct, or I look up from a huge cutting and I think, some poor devil did that with a pick and a shovel. Train on a journey, train on a track, take me where I want to go. And Thank next week we join Dick Warner along the route of what became the Great Northern Railway, linking the two most influential cities on the island. Ironing the Land, next Wednesday at 8.30. Ironing the Land. Ironing the land. Railway sleeper, get no rest. Ride the iron horse into the west. With a pick and a shovel to the mountain pass. The boys of the Barrow Gang With stone, steel and sand Ironing the land